Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Denise Potter has been a registered dietitian nutritionist for over 30 years. For the past 13 years, she has focused on ketogenic medical nutrition therapy. She strives to provide client-centered personalized, personalized therapy, counseling, and education. Denise has a passion for helping underserved populations benefit from ketogenic diet therapies. Throughout her career, Denise has worked with clients of all ages, guiding them through a diverse range of medical conditions, including epilepsy, cancer, Parkinson's, diabetes, autism, bipolar disorder, and many more. Her extensive knowledge and experience in ketogenic therapies have earned her recognition as a leading expert, and she has had the honor of training healthcare professionals all around the world. Denise is the author of the fantastic book, The Migraine Diet, a ketogenic meal plan for headache relief. On a personal level, Denise has been married to the love of her life, Terry, for over 30 years, has four amazing children, and loved to, loves to laugh. A quick way to her heart is a huge bowl of guacamole or a crazy story since truth is funnier than fiction. That is very true. You can find Denise Potter at potterketogenic.diet. Denise Potter, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thank you. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's such an honor to host you, like I said, offline. A big bowl of guacamole sounds great all the time, mm -hmm. so I love mm -hmm. that. <laughs> and you're right, uh, fiction, I, I love the quote by Tom Clancy, who is the fiction writer, that says, the only difference between truth and fiction is that fiction needs to make sense. And I think uh, that's very true. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Like that. Uh, oh. That's awesome. When you first started getting interested in health and going to school, could you ever imagine that there would be oh. a nutritional approach that could help treat and sometimes debatably like reverse some of the conditions you would go on later to study? Oh my gosh, absolutely not. I, I had no idea until I landed in ketogenic diet for epilepsy. I had, I'd never, I'd seen people have some benefit from nutrition for sure, but compliance was always so difficult and it just was, you know, minimal benefit. I just felt like, and so not, not, of course, nutrition can have a lot of benefits. So I don't want to say, but I just felt like the things that I was doing personally, like, okay, here's your low salt diet, or here's your low cholesterol diet, or here's your incredibly high carb diet for diabetes that we used to do. You know, you just weren't helping people very much with some, some of those things. It all was condition related, you know, as to the benefit. But then when I walked into keto, and start seeing these people. And I always say like this quote, because I've heard it many times when a parent or, you know, a parent of an, an adult or a child says, I got my kid back. And whether that's because of epilepsy or bipolar or schizophrenia, they're getting their child back. And it's been amazing. That's incredible. Through this podcasting journey, we've been able to interview so many people when it comes to ketogenic and, and you know, mental health and the relation between the two. Dr. Chris Palmer, we interviewed Nicole Laurent many times, the keto counselor, um, Eric Collette, the founder of A Mind for All Seasons. And it's really amazing to talk to some of these experts and experts like yourself. Like, you know so much about this stuff. You've forgotten more about this than I'll ever learn mm -hmm. in my life. But I think back a few weeks ago, we did an interview um, with Eric Collette and Hulk Cramner and one of their patients in, in assisted living who has since left assisted living. Her name is Melissa. And she scored a 14 wow. out of 30 on one of the tests that shows how demented she was. So that's kind of moderate to getting to severe dementia. She left several weeks ago, the assisted living clinic scoring a two out of 30, which means she's basically wow. reversed all of her symptoms. She is volunteering at a hospital nearby. She wants to train <laughs> to become a health coach at age 70. And that it, it just hits home that like talking to the experts is amazing. We've learned so much. But when, when I'm looking at a human who is having a conversation and the people that knew her when she went into the clinic are like, we're amazed that you can remember what we mm. just talked about three minutes ago. It's like, it's so much, it's, it's so cool to see a life completely transformed. Yeah, that's that's a great story. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love that. It's so amazing. So, yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your story and how you got interested in mental health to begin with. Um. Wow. With with mental health, honestly, um, back and I don't know exactly how long. Maybe five years ago, four, five, six years ago, Dr. Palmer had you know contacted me or somehow we connected and he started sending a few patients 
over um, because, you know, he knew I was doing ketogenic therapies for epilepsy and migraines and different conditions. And so he said, Hey, I need somewhere to send these people. I can't do all this on my own. He was reaching the point of, of saturation with the time. And so he started sending a few people over and, and I started having, you know, some people that had just great success. And other than that, I had never, never really used it for that before. You know, we realized that you know, children with epilepsy, wow, their behavior's better, they feel better, or maybe, you know, their attitudes are better, you know, things that I used to always attribute that to think, well, if you're having fewer seizures, of course, you feel better, of course, you're behaving better, because now your brain's not going zzz, zzz, all day long. And, and so that's, I didn't really think a lot about it impacting these other conditions. And so basically, once he started sending people over is when I started doing that. So really not terribly long ago. Yeah. A nice relationship with Dr. Chris Palmer. That's not bad. <laughs> not yeah, bad at all. Yeah. He's a great guy. And he just, you know, he obviously cares deeply about his patients and just, you know, works really hard to, to find, you know, find places for them. Cares deeply is probably the understatement of the year. Like when you mm -hmm. hear the audiobook mm -hmm. of brain energy, or I've gotten to see him present, like when you hear mm -hmm. the emotion in his voice, yeah. like that is a human <laughs> who really, really cares. He's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that's interesting. And that's when I, and I have 10 dietitians on my team. When I look for somebody, I want, I want someone who has good keto experience, but I want someone who really cares. And because if you yeah. don't care as much as I do, then I don't want you to work for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I want to go back even a little bit further to your career as a dietitian. When did you actually start getting interested in nutrition and what kind of things were you taught? I'm assuming pretty classical kind of dietitian stuff. Yeah. I classic <laughs> dietitian. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Classic dietitian training. Um, you know, we learn a lot of the very basic, you know, super important things, you know, that we have to know with metabolism and, and human health and, and human anatomy and physiology and such. Um, but of course, nothing about keto. It just wasn't a thing back in the, wow, to, to college in the late eighties. And so as far as interest in nutrition, it was really, I, I really, I fell into it almost as easily as I fell into keto. It was, I mean, it's almost embarrassing to say, I just um, was trying to decide a college major. And I, I said something about nutrition being interesting. And my mom said, you should do that. You should be a dietitian then. And I said, okay. She said, well, you should go to Michigan state. And I said, okay. So I did. I mean, it was very, you know, I, I was at, this was during my first year of college and I didn't really have a, you know, a goal, a dream at that point. And so, but when I went, I, you know, you start taking, I started taking those classes and immediately I loved it. I never looked back, you know, where sometimes people struggle around in majors, but I, so I never looked back. I always enjoyed it. always loved being a dietitian, but love the education aspect. I really disliked being in a hospital where you just have to make rounds just to show that you were there and you really don't do anything, which sometimes that happens just to satisfy joint commission requirements really gravitated toward, oh, this person has diabetes. I think I can help them or they need, you know, an education on this diet. I can help them. So I always really wanted that personal interaction so much more than anything else. And, and gravitated toward things like diabetes and gestational diabetes, where you really felt like you could make an impact and people would listen and you'd have some compliance. So I kept leaning toward that area. And then, um, after, um, i was off work for five years. I had, I have four kids. So after I had the third one, I stopped for a while that this is too much. I can't do this. Um, need to get back to work. We were getting hungry and ended up at university of Michigan. And they said in the interview, you know, can you do ketogenic diet? And I'm like, well, sure. <laughs> you know, if you teach me, I can. And it was just part of our outpatient clinic. It was, so I would see anybody with any condition, so imagine anybody at a hospital like University of Michigan where they could have anything wrong with them. Uh, I was seeing any known condition and epilepsy with ketogenic therapies. And so I really um, didn't know anything, literally had an hour of training and was set loose to see about the five to 10 patients that they had. It was really a small, you know, small area. And over time, we started working together and um, shout out to Dr. Renee Shellhaas, who came over there from CHOP in Philadelphia. And she said, we need to, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to start organizing this. And so we started meeting and it just really organically grew into a team. We just kept pulling people in and growing and I said, hey, you need a dietitian to do keto only. My first thought was for it to be someone else uh, because I didn't like it. I didn't understand it. I hadn't 
read anything, didn't know anything. And after about a year, we got the position approved and I'm seeing parents come in and tell you exactly what I said. You know, I got my kid back and I'm seeing these kids that, you know, had a hundred seizures a day and now they have two or none or 10, you know, um, and then I was sold and I said, okay, that's, that's my job. And so I took the position that we created and then the rest is history. And we ended up with three dietitians by the time I left and it was fabulous and grew into a really fabulous program that they still have there. Um, wow. but then from there, just to take it one step farther, um, people started calling my office saying, um, can you put me on a diet? I have cancer. Like I'm at, you know, my children's hospital and this is a 50 year old with cancer and this doesn't really work. So, so I'm like, yeah, I'll meet you at McDonald's. They have Wi-Fi, you know, or Panera. And I hurried up and grabbed some liability insurance and started seeing people just here and there, you know, it was just an occasional person, but it was, wow, there's something going on here. And, um, and of course I just, you know, looked real quickly to see, oh, well, it makes sense. Cancer feeds on sugar. I can lower your sugar. Let's do it. You know, it was a pretty easy step. It made, it made sense. Just like with, just like with the, the psychiatric health, we're using the same medicine. So how hard is it to think we could use the same diet? I mean, it, it just, you know, you don't even, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of, of, of energy to realize that it's something you should try. And so, yeah, so that just evolved into over just a couple of years, a uh, private practice that I couldn't maintain without leaving that job. And so I just, you know, said goodbye and they, you know, I said they can certainly fill in and find somebody to do what I'm doing there. Um, but this is really exciting over here to do this in some different areas. It's an so, amazing journey. Yeah, That's so it's awesome. been really, yeah, just a very organic, it's, it sounds like fast or a big deal or whatever, but it's really not. It was just this natural progression of here's the next door. Let's just walk through it. So, wow. yeah. Very cool. I think that the thing that surprised me the most initially is you switching from Michigan state to Michigan. I thought that was like illegal or something. <laughs> it is, but you know what, when you're hungry and, and Ann Arbor will send you paychecks, you do that. Yeah. There I know. You go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you but switch right Michigan, Again, Michigan State is the University of Michigan, um, you know, but yeah. So no, U of, M, U of M's great. You have to, we can roll both. It's just, it's anybody that, it's anybody other than Ohio State really is that, okay. That's right. I mean, that's if you want right. to get down yeah. to it, as long as it's not Ohio <laughs> State, we can deal with it. That's definitely mm -hmm. illegal for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I want to go back to your time at um, Michigan State and like your day-to-day clinical practice you're seeing people you're you're treating disease or hoping to treat disease trying to create traction what is your job satisfaction what is that like are you seeing people change are you happy with the way things are going like what was it like kind of in the beginning there oh let me go back when you said so michigan state's just my college education and then i did an internship at university of arkansas but you I mean see. as far as clinical practice yes, university clinical of practice. michigan at u of m yeah, when i'm in keto is that what you meant uh, no, before you made the transition, you, you said you took the five years break in between and then ended up right. in Michigan. But while, while you were practicing clinically, like what, what was your- Just clinical you know, early age? on. Yeah. Yeah. So early on as a dietitian, I mean, so I worked at some several, some small hospitals where I just saw anybody, you know, anybody with any medical conditions. So you're seeing renal patients, people, um, as far as kind of, were you saying kind of like job satisfaction? Is that where you were saying where you were going yeah. towards? Like, well, yeah, so, like, like. You feel like you were making a huge impact. Yeah, you know, in some areas, yes. I mean, there were some things like, okay, well, these people are on tube feeding or they're on parental nutrition and you're managing things like that that you know they have to have this to survive. Um, you know, those things are are more, you know, this is great. Um, so some of that was good, but then sometimes you're just filling a need and it's someone who really doesn't have any nutrition needs and but you have to assess them and do a quick assessment. They've been in the hospital for seven days, you know, things like that. I, I, I didn't enjoy, but that's where I was like, Ooh, you just got diagnosed with diabetes. Let me, <laughs> let me at you, you know, uh, and try to, you know, then you, then I'm in there half the day trying to help somebody like that. So it just, so again, the job satisfaction and enjoyment was good. And, and as far as results, yeah, you see, you know, you're helping people that have malnutrition, but I'll tell you early on in my career, what a dietitian did, what we really, did and were um, working with um, versus now the high acuity of things I deal with now are night and day. I mean, that was, you know, we were going around um, just 
you know, you know, are you eating and are you, you know, just kind of really much more basic evaluations. I mean, looking at labs and looking at things, I'm like, are you eating is a little bit too general, but um, it just was such a lower acuity. I mean, it's partly because of where I was and smaller hospitals. But once I hit um, University of Michigan and that, um, that layer of acuity within the ketogenic diet program, that's like, wow, we're in ICU, you know, assisting the doctors, the ICU, you know, doctors with what to do with a child that's laying there seizing and literally about to die. And we're the ones telling them what to do. And I'm like, I, you know, I'd go home literally crying sometimes like this is, I didn't sign up for this and I don't make enough money for this. Um, you know, I mean, just saying as a dietitian, you really, you, I never expected to literally, you know, hold someone's life in my hands. And in some of these situations, you really are, you're a, you're a piece of a team. I don't want to take, try and take too much credit, but you're a piece of a team that is making decisions that are life saving. And it's not even just someone laying in ICU because now again, going out to psychiatric, which is just where we're so hot right now, these people, you know, they may, you know, they're suicidal, they're desperate, they can't hold a job because of these conditions. And so you're also holding their life in your hands. And if you can help them, if we can help them, their life is forever changed. I mean, they're doing all the hard work. You know, we're just, we're just presenting them with, you know, so to speak, a plate of food, presenting them with information. And then they either can do it or their family can help them do it. And then, you know, from there, it's, it's up to them. Again, they, they're doing all the hard work, but hopefully we can walk with them through it. But yeah, it's, I never, you know, that's kind of the original question you asked me, did I ever think that you could have such an impact with food? And absolutely not. I was just more like, yeah, we eat healthy and you want to have a healthy body and you live a healthy life. And you know, that real much more, you know, young and idealistic, I guess. Um, this is, this is just so much more. I just, yeah, it's hard to express. Higher stakes. It sounds like with much higher consequence. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So type two diabetes is maybe a good example. So if we go back before your Michigan time, we, if you had a type two diabetic patient that you really wanted to get after, what was the message? What was, what were you trying to say? Was it like, oh. you need to dose your carbohydrates and then dose your insulin is what I would expect. It's pretty. Oh, you had to ask. Sorry. Um, we've got to dig yeah, out these yeah. Yeah. Get it, get it out. Okay. So I've, I've said many times, I feel like I should send letters of apology um, to all the people I worked with, with diabetes. And honestly, but I'll tell you, we, yeah, we would manage the carbs. We would give people, I mean, I had set plans. If you were on 1500 calories, you got 45 grams of carb per meal, 15 per snack or 15 to 30 per snack. So add that up, what, 100, you know, whatever per day, 150, 180 a day um, on a 1500 calorie diet. And then, you know, 1800 calories, we'll give them 16 grams, 60 grams of carb a meal. Um, 2200, bam, 75 grams of carb per meal and, you know, 30 per snack. So whatever that math is a lot, 250, you know, getting up to that. And, and we thought, and I think realistically it still was that that was a cutback. If I could get right. somebody, I mean, and so it all like in, you know, in defense of the times, if I could get somebody to only eat a cup and a half of spaghetti and only eat one piece of bread, that's a win because probably a lot of people might eat two plates of spaghetti. So, so still there were benefits to that. But what the sad thing is, is, you know, we think, oh, well, no one's going to cut back that far. You know, no one's going to do this. No one's going to like, well, maybe no one until you tell them it could really help or prove it could really help. So, yeah, but we did see benefit. And that's one thing I liked about diabetes because I said, you know, I can help someone get their blood sugar down, whether or not they lose weight. Because sometimes, you know, in these cases, the weight loss is, is hard slash impossible. And so with the current, the meds we had then now more medication aids that are helping weight loss for good or for bad. Um, but I could help them. I could get their glucose down and, and, you know, more reasonable and more managed by cutting their carbs. Maybe it was in half for some people. So yeah. yes, I feel like I help them, but looking back. Yeah. And then you'd have to manage it. Yeah. Oh, you took your insulin. Okay. Well, you have to eat and well, and you still do, you know, but it's just so much different. Um, 
Yeah. Wow. I know. I I I have a lot. I don't. I don't want to say regrets because I think I did a great job with what the current understanding was at the time. I think I did a good job for people, but I, you know, I wish I would have known more. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I totally agree with you. You're doing the best you can at that time. Mm -hmm. Ironically, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like, ironically, getting on to 150 to 200 grams of carbohydrates a day is probably half of what these people are doing at home. Mm -hmm. You could easily mm -hmm. get into that range if just by drinking soda or something that everybody right. was doing at the time anyway. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So you transitioned over, I believe it was what, like 15 years ago, I think you mm -hmm. said at Michigan. You know, 2007, I started 2007. at UM. Yep. Yep. Early, early times. I'm, I'm guessing that mm -hmm. by the time you started this, you were not seeing keto on magazine covers at the grocery store. Like, this is very, <laughs> no. very early on. What, what kind of resistance were you meeting? Like this must've been totally weird and different for you to learn about. No, well, so not, I wasn't getting resistance. So at the, in the clinic, I mean, it was just a, a doctor referred, pay, you know, referred people and their child be, by the time people got referred, especially early on, um, at that point, they got referred because they were very refractory epilepsy. And so the parents were most often happy to do it. Not thrilled because it's really hard work, not thrilled because they have to come in the hospital for a week, but absolutely, we will do whatever it takes to help our child. And sometimes it'd be frustrating because maybe some people get passed over or the diet not recommended. They think, oh, there's no way they're going to be able to do it because of maybe social reasons or something. And like, don't, please don't discount a mom <laughs> um, who wants to help her child or a dad who wants to help his child. So, so yeah, the resistance wasn't really huge, but I'd say more so the resistance from the doctors to refer. Um, but as we developed a better program and a better structure, you could see why maybe they don't want to refer people to something that really doesn't exist. Like you can say, you're going to put this kid on the diet, but who's going to see him? Who's going to support him? What's going to happen? And um, the dietitian before me had retired, but she had done a great job in seeing people, but she only had so much time. She had this full clinic. She's trying to see all these other people and keto. And so that was a frustration. And that's why based on what she had said and kind of you know complained, honestly, I said, well, we need a separate dietitian for that. And so, yeah, so as we develop that, of course, the doctors now, while we have a thriving program, they're going to send us patients now because they know that when they send them over, we're going to take great care of them. And that's how that went. So no, not as far as resistance that in that way, but we still, and I get really salty about this and I love to get on this soapbox. I've got a couple of soapboxes if you want to hear them. Um, but, one, <laughs> but one of them is, um, is neurologists that do not recommend the diet when appropriate. And so here's, you know, um, just here, this is my, you know, concern is there's a consensus statement that the first one came out in 2008. The second one came out in 2018, Dr. Kossoff, Beth Zubek-Kania, people on that consensus statement and many clinicians from around the world utilizing ketogenic therapies for epilepsy. Okay, it's very specific. And it says, um, after two medications have failed, the next thing you should try should be diet because of the diminishing likelihood, like less than 5% chance that that third medication is going to help their epilepsy. And so, um, and this has been proven that, there, that, that the likelihood of you know, more than the third med helping is was has been reproven again in the, like around either 2018 or 20 with all the new meds. Okay. So it's not just that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we get those results, even with the newer meds, we still aren't getting results. So it's unfortunate, but probably not a lot of hope once you've tried a couple of medications that are appropriately, appropriately prescribed based on the epilepsy. So knowing that, knowing that this information has been out for a very long time, knowing, knowing that there are, I believe, seven randomized controlled trials for epilepsy, uh, there's no excuse for a physician not saying to those parents, your child has, you know, refractory epilepsy, you need to put on him for on a ketogenic therapy. But that's not what happens. I'd say that happens, this is Denise's numbers, less than 5% of the time. Okay, they continue to the next med to the next med. I think it's malpractice, malpractice in the purest form that they're not practicing properly. They're not offering the, what they need to. And if they do not have a program, which I fully understand, they're only about, about 110 pediatric programs in the U.S., then 
I'm sorry, then you refer them to a program, right? If you have to travel and then if that's prohibited, fine, at least they were told, at least they were given the option to do this. Um, there are still nine or 10 states that don't even have programs. So it's a big, it's still, even though in the US we have a lot of keto, we don't have nearly enough for that population. And what we're seeing and the evidence will roll in with psychiatric, but what, you know, I think we're going to find, this is again, just projecting. So maybe I shouldn't, but I think we're going to find that it's going to, it's going to help certain people. It's going to help certain classes. It's going to help certain conditions more than others. And, um, and we're also going to, you know, there are probably numbers on how many, um, you know, after, you know, after two psych meds or three psych meds or four psych meds, what's the likelihood of the next one working? I'm sure there probably is that, um, that report because we're seeing people that come in on upwards of 30 medications and then still have benefit from the diet and sometimes great benefit, sometimes nearly hundred percent benefit. So all that, all that to say, you know, kind of complaining back to, you know, the neurologists, we need to continue to educate them, which one of my friends, um, shout out to Lisa Venata, dietitian at Phoenix Children's, and also works with me. She was just at AES, the American Epilepsy Society, last week presenting on ketogenic therapies, or this week, actually, you know, presenting on ketogenic therapies, and it was well attended, and that's great. So we're always trying to get that information out. Um, but it's been out so long. I don't know what we're waiting for. <laughs> and and yeah. my biggest gripe with all of this is the language that you're using is like, we have to wait until after these medications fail. Like the first one mm. maybe does okay. And then after the second one fails, or sometimes I've heard of doing like a double medication mm. and, and then we wait until that fails. And then after all of that, then maybe let's try the diet. Well, mm. why, why can't we try the diet from the beginning? Like a low barrier mm. to entry. I, you know, it might be difficult in the beginning and people may need education on how to do it, mm -hmm. but eating some eggs and some vegetables, if you want mm -hmm. and keep your carbohydrates really low, just doing that alone could be so beneficial. Yeah. We could start with that. Well, and we, you know, and, and I see lots of people that we do that. I mean, you know, there's absolutely, I see parents that will come to me and say, well, they want to put, I mean, I had one, we just did a week or two ago, they had tried one med and the doctors, you know, want to put them on a second med and they said, no way, here we are said, all right, let's go, you know, and that, and that's great. Um, it's just, there are those people that are, you know, 70% or so of people will be helped by the first med or, or for the, by the first two. And there's definitely a layer of us in society or layer of people in society that if they can take a medication and not do anything else, then they'd rather do it. Okay. So, you know, so I get that, but yes, why, if, if we have, here's my, and I don't know how to prove this, but the efficacy of the diet is so strong after all these meds have been trialed and after all this time has been wasted. Yes. Can, can you imagine if we would say um, it needs to be done? And there are some, thankfully, some places where the diet is first line, um, specifically in epilepsy and GLUT1 and pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, I hope one day maybe in tubular sclerosis complex that it might be considered first line. So, and when we get it first line, some of these other things, then it, it kind of, you know, it, it paves the way a little bit. Um, but in, unless there's, you know, unless it's a life threatening, you know, seizure base, then I think it's a great idea to try first line. Yeah. And it's amazing that people are finding their way towards you. It's, it's kind of mm -hmm. coming from the underground that they're learning about this. It's a shame mm -hmm. that it's not coming from the top down, but the more and more of these stories we get, I think we're going to be able to kind of turn the tide on that. But, mm -hmm. but let's, let's talk to the listener who maybe said, okay, I've heard of keto. I did it. I lost 20 pounds. That was cool. Um, you know, I, I, I ate some keto snacks and keto treats. Let, let's talk about that versus what we talk about in the introduction at ketogenic diet therapy. This is what Brett Scher talks about a lot as well. Like what is the difference between keto that can help you kind of lose weight versus mm -hmm. ketogenic nutritional therapy? Okay. So what I see, and we sometimes we call it Facebook keto or whatever, you know, where someone, and it, there's nothing wrong with that, where right. someone's like, you know what, man, I'm, I, I'm not eating any sugar. I've cut out, you know, my big carbs, not eating too much fruit. And, um, you know, again, just trying to eat a more holistic, healthy diet or carnivore, um, doing that. Um, that's fine. But a lot of times, unless you're trying really pretty hard, it is relatively hard to stay in ketosis. Um, I, I say hard. Um you know, kind of air quotes, because if you are doing the right things, it's not that hard. But if you don't realize that, oh my gosh, I, 
I ate, you know, three bites of an apple between meals, um, thinking, oh, it's not much. Well, that might knock your ketones from two to 0.5, you know, or gone, um, because you just had, you know, half an apple, a few bites. Um, so just some really small things will take you in and out of ketosis. And so it's not, and it's not that it's not bad. If you're just trying to lose weight, you really don't need this high level of ketosis. Um, and that's fine. And even just to, I want to feel better. I want to have more energy. You don't need to have ketones of two or three to get that. Although you will with ketones of two or three, um, not necessarily lose weight. That's another story we'll talk about anyway. So therapeutic nutritional ketosis is when you're staying in ketosis for a period of time long enough to get the body to heal from, you know, from some situation. So whether it be epilepsy or bipolar disorder or depression or schizophrenic, schizoaffective disorder. So we're trying to maintain healing and it's like a medication. It's very much a medication. You can't go on and off and on and off and expect the same results. So if you, if the doctor gives you insulin and you only take it every other day, you can't really expect the results that you would get if you took it every day. And that's the, the hard part. And that doesn't mean if people make a mistake, they screw up, they have a bad day or a bad weekend or a bad meal, that it's all over. It's not like that. But obviously, the more compliant you are, the longer that your ketones are high, you know, and I say high, I'll define that, um, you know, the better. And we tell people for these different medical conditions that they're working with the diet, um, I tell them three to four months, I've almost just defaulted to saying four months just to kind of get their mental head on four months. Um, and back to epilepsy, because that's where the most evidence is, um, pediatrics, 3.2 months. They would say, you really need to try it at least 3.2 months. So just that's in kids where their brain is growing and say pliable, you know, it's, it's um, more changes are happening there easier. So with that, I'm just pushing it even just to say four months and let's, because it also can take them a couple, a week or two to get into really decent ketosis. Um, if people fly into really good ketosis right away, they're, you know, often they're ill and they have keto flu. And I always tell people that work with us, you know, we don't allow keto flu. We don't um, subscribe to that because it's not necessary. There's really no reason to throw yourself into ketosis in one day. Um, it's not, there's not never been any known advantage with that, with being quicker to have better results. So, so yeah. Um, uh, ketone numbers are a question people always have, you know, what should my ketones be? And, um, it's a loaded question because one, I'll just say, we don't know Two, maybe over two would be great for a lot of conditions. Um, over three might be great depending. And, but it's whatever works for you. I have people with brain tumors that never had ketones, you know, over two at all. And they're seven or eight years out from a glioblastoma. Um, and ran in the one and two range. So their GKI never hit really the goal, um, but but they maintained it and, and can continue. And then other people with um, someone with um, bipolar one right now, and she's rolling in the 0.8 to 1.8 range and feels great. She's not 100%. I'd say she's 90% um, improved and life is 100% different for her because of it and looking for a job or actually going to start a job next year. And she's not running over two. I'd love it if she could run over two, just because, just because, you know, what if she could get that last 10%, um, but she can do this and she feels great and we're accomplishing this. So we're not going to, you know, um, nitpick and, and, and try to have her accomplish something she can't because compliance is a huge concern. How do we get people to keep doing this? Because, because again, staying in ketosis sometimes can be really hard because it's really easy to drop down. It's, and sometimes really frustrating. If you eat a couple ounces too much, you know, protein, um, your ketones drop from, you know, maybe from two down to one, like, oh, what did I do? Well, you know, maybe you had a bad day, got stressed and your blood sugar went up. Maybe you ate too much meat. Um, maybe there were you ate too many, you know, fake fiber keto products, uh, you, you know, I say fake fiber, but you know, too many products that were too processed, um, uh, maybe too many sweeteners, you know, there's so many things that might be driving that. So sorry, I kind of went out a no. couple of roads there. No. 
That's great. Like the first time I saw slim fast branded keto snacks that were super expensive. I lifted up the package. It was three ounces total for like $10 of all these like keto snacks. Like, mm-hmm. give me a break. Like this isn't, yeah. this isn't the same thing that mm-hmm. we're kind of talking about as far as ketosis. Yeah, and that's yeah. where I want to go next to this question. What is it specifically about being in a state of ketosis that's so much better for the brain? So, um, the brain really likes, and this is a better question for Dr. Palmer, but the brain really seems to like ketones. I mean, you know, it seems like it just, just the energy is different. I mean, and you know, it cause it's like, you, you feel sharper, you feel more clear, um, people with, with brain fog, you know, it's just clearing the mitochondria is functioning better. And so, I mean, those are just the quick things I think of. I mean, it's, it's just. Yeah. I mean, as far as getting, like I said, down to the, you know, the, all the chemical interactions, that's just, that's not my jam as far as trying to like really adequately explain those. So I get nervous to try and get into the the mitochondria and, and talk about that. Um, But yeah, it just, obviously the brain runs on glucose fine too, and that's fine, but probably, and you've probably, you know, talked about this before with people, but you know, we weren't, probably meant to never be on running on ketones, you, you know, I mean, in our just general, you know, go back a hundred years, 200 years, whatever, a thousand years. And people didn't have, you know, depending on society and, and their food availability, people were not running on this fully fed state all the time, you know, three meals and snacks a day. It's just not how people always, you know, were living and running. And so, um, you know, so probably it's much more natural to be in and out of ketosis, you know, which is a lot, a lot of people even just doing intermittent fasting, not even doing keto are now feeling so much better and losing weight because they're doing that in just in and of itself. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yes. So many people in our world would argue that we would be way more in a state of ketosis than we would in a different state being fed carbohydrates, just with how few carbohydrates be available on the land. I mean, I'm looking out your window outside there's not (laughs) a lot of things growing out there so if you Mm -hmm. you go out and find food you'd inevitably have to hunt or you'd be in trouble oh yeah oh yeah yep let's go out there and shoot a deer yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah wow so let's talk about some of the other conditions we've talked a little bit a little bit about epilepsy but it it seems like ketogenic diets can help with all kind of mental disorders is it down the same kind of pathways that like you said like the brain tends to prefer um ketones as a fuel and just performs better when it has that fuel available yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what it seems to be. It seems to perform better. It seems like it's, it's, it's promoting healing. And, and again, and I, there's so many, you know, you get decreased ROS and you get, you know, GABA and you just so many of the, again, I feel like you need a scientist to talk through all those things. I don't even like to try because I feel like there's so many people better at that, but, but what we see over time, you know, time in ketosis. And sometimes I'll say this too, that it's the time in ketosis, I think, versus, uh, you know, always the numbers. I mean, sometimes it is in numbers and Dr. Ian Campbell also with his most recent evidence saying, hey, these people with depression um, and bipolar were doing better when they were over two. Okay. So definitely there's partly that I, I believe in the numbers. I'm always pushing the ketones, but sometimes we would have um, people like we, we have them on the diet and they're on it for three months, four months, five months, and we're still pushing. And maybe we have them in really high ketosis and then we're weaning the diet. And what I used to think was, oh, wow. Oh, we've hit the sweet spot. They're on this ratio of two to one and their, their ketones are, you know, 2.5 to three or, you know, two to three, whatever, name, name a number. And they seem like they're doing so much better. And now I look back and think, I think it's just because they were on the diet six months. I think it, I think it was just time that the brain was in that state of ketosis for so much longer that the healing that was taking place just continued to happen. And we tell people that with psychiatric conditions too, all the time is that with, um, you know, we say, try this four months. As a matter of fact, I had to explain that. And, and this is something someone said to this week. Um, I had to explain because he thought, oh, like, do the diet four months. Cause they just thought you hear all this. We all say three months, four months, do the diet, you know? And I said, Oh my gosh, we need to do a better job of explaining that because what we mean is trial the diet three or four months and see if it's helping you that by no means that means that's the end of what it's going to do for you. That means, is it worth continuing? And then very likely 
you may have further benefit, further benefit, you know, as you move on throughout the year and two years. And what we're, I'm not personally working on yet. I hope I'm involved later, but they're working on a psychiatric consensus statement. And I don't know if Nicole, she, she may be in on that or if anybody has mentioned it, but they're going to get some type of consensus guidelines like they did with epilepsy and take that out to a lot of people that are currently practicing and, you know, get a, a expert opinion basically and then say, okay, wh what do we do? You know, how long do we push them hard on the diet? How long do we push for ketones over to? And, and then, okay, is there a maintenance phase? You know, do we say, cause a lot of people are doing this after a year or two on the diet, they, they, they are relaxing down and maybe their ketones are running a little lower now, but they're still having the same benefits. And I think that's really important because I'll, I'll tell people, I want, I want, let's do this. Let's see if it works. Let's go hardcore for a while. And then let's maintain it as long as you can. And then we pull back because in the long term, I'd love it if you could live on 50 grams of carbon instead of 20 or 30. I'd love it if you could live on 60, you know, 70. You know, like what's, you know, what's your activity level? How many carbs can you get away with? Be in ketosis. I mean, 50, 60, I mean, that's getting into a high level. You're not gonna get high ketones there, but just saying that, but what could somebody get away with and still feel great after a couple of years of a real therapeutic diet. Um, and that's, those are things we're going to learn as these studies come out. Um, so we need people doing long-term studies. Some of the studies are more short-term, 12 weeks, you know, what's working, but we need also studies that are following people out over several years. And I hope, you know, some of them are, I'm sure some of them are going to do that. Yeah. No, that's, I, I kind of noticed the same thing with people. It's like, yeah, if you've gone 40 or 50 years with eating pizza and donuts and soda, you're going to need a period of hardcore time. If you want to try to mm -hmm. get ahead of mm -hmm. some of this stuff, you're going to create a lot of problems afterwards. It's not like, okay, you did it. Now go back to the same stuff that caused yeah. all these problems <laughs> to begin with. Don't go back to the donuts or the pizza, but you can, you can yeah. open up a little bit. It's not like 50 grams of carbohydrates made anybody diabetic it's it's super high levels of all this ultra processed food right you you kind of lost the right to be able to continue that for the rest of your life go strict mm -hmm. and then open it up and see what you can include i think that's totally reasonable yeah. um and we talk about some of these other you know more serious mental issues and somebody might be listening and maybe they're a little younger and they're thinking like okay i don't really need to worry about this sure i get a little brain fog in the afternoon or maybe i forget things a little bit more than i used to but i don't i don't have dementia i don't really care about that i don't care about some of these other things what would you mm -hmm. tell somebody like that wow well that i mean that's tricky because if they're if they're health conscious right if, if, they're, if they're health conscious and they want to you know, want to plan ahead and say, yeah, I, I like, it's kind of like playing for retirement and say, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that old. I don't have to worry. Um, and I don't really need to save any money, you know, or, or I'll die before then anyway, you know? So, so yeah, if, if it's someone who wants to plan ahead thinking of why would you not, you know, feed your body the best thing possible. You only get one, you only get one. And I think, I think the, um, the environment, you know, this, I feel like, you know, social media has really helped improve the environment, you know, being healthy is, is cool now, you know, being it, it's, it's, it's more cool, you know, it's more um, in, in style to be healthy, be fit and be eating fit. It's more um, men are more interested in health and nutrition, I feel like, than they ever used to be. I feel like um, it really is a different culture, because it used to be more so women. I mean, if you look at dietitians, you know how many male dietitians there are? I mean, I don't even know what percent, you know, I'm sure less than 5% if I had to guess. Sure. Um, now, partly that's a pay scale issue probably, but um, it's a field that's attracted women for whatever reason. But now, you know, men want to cook, men want to do this. And, you know, just again, just you know, over the last, whatever, 10, 15, 20 years. So it's just, I don't know, I just feel like I just kind of changed subject, but it just, um, it's so much more, you know, more popular to want to take care of your body. So as I started to tell, talk to someone about that, and I really don't have many people like that because that those type of people aren't coming to me. Um, right. You know, they're not coming to me because they aren't going to pay, you know, the fees we have to charge. They don't need a therapeutic diet, right? So I don't see me, but that might be my my family, you know, my kids where they're like, oh, wow, you know, we, we don't need to eat this, you know, these things that, you know, 15 years ago, I might've, you know, bought in the house and now I never would rarely would, you know, um, you know, and where they just see that, wow, there's just a lot more vegetables and where's the potatoes, you know? Um, <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's really interesting trying to, 
to navigate that too. Also with your family versus, you know, right. versus, you know, what we do is um, you know, with, with our patients. Yeah, right. And and that brings something else up. It's one thing if you're working with the families of children with epilepsy, what about the compliance and the children themselves? I mean, this is going to feel very unfair for some of these kiddos mm -hmm. that are like watching all their friends have birthday parties and like little mm -hmm. crack addicts, like eating the cake and running around in circles. Like, <laughs> do, 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 do the kids comply with some of this stuff? Like are they super motivated to be feeling better and not having seizures? Well, yes, compliance is overall, I say very good. Um, the more, um, the more, um, intellectual, you know, if, if the child doesn't have any intellectual disabilities, the harder it is. We try to approach it like an allergy for people to try to say, you know what, there are some kids that they can't touch peanuts and they can't touch this, or they can't have gluten. And it's much more common, um, you know, in schools now where there's so many different allergies that people can't, uh, you know, take other kids food and such. So we try to think of it like that. Um, there are books different kids and people have written, you know, a special diet, magic diet, so-and-so's diet. I've got one above me somewhere here and trying to help them understand. But, but I have, um, I have one patient, she's been on diet, wow, about three years now. And she's frustrated. You know, she goes to her soccer games and her this and this birthday parties and she can't, she can't eat these things. And she's so mad sometimes on the flip side she was falling over, you know, 20 times a day, hitting her head. There was no soccer. There was no horseback riding. There were none of these things for her. And there never would have been gymnastics, all these things she can do now because she's on this therapy. And so it's, it's hard to get adults to understand that and comply, let alone a child. But with a child, you have the parents, you know, making them comply. So yeah, now and then you get a child that they're sneaking food here and there, or they're cheating or whatever. And that happens, but we just, we just work with it. And I'm, I'm all about parents, you know, paying them like, you know what, they don't want to take their supplements, give them, give them a quarter every day when they take their vitamins then, or give them, you know, give them money or give them money instead of the, you know, have them bring the cupcake home and then give them a dollar that they didn't need it, reward mm. them and then let them buy a whatever's the latest, you know, newest video game. I don't want to try to say whatever the newest one is, but you know, let them save up. And that's, again, you have to do that based on the intellectual ability of the child. And then some kids just don't understand and don't know, right. They just have a uh, debilitating condition and it doesn't matter, but then it's emotionally hard. It's hard for the parents than the kids because some children have so many disabilities and Food is one of the last frontiers and you're taking it away, so to speak. But if it works, you're giving them so much more, but it is a really hard thing for the parents sometimes. And sometimes people won't put a child on a diet because of that. And it's yeah. really, it's really, really tough, but compliance with kids is surprisingly good. Um, yeah, it's surprisingly good. And when, yeah, when they feel better, you can try to reason with them. I, I don't think we give kids enough credit. I think they're very smart. And I think the kid will understand like, yeah, I can play soccer. I can ride a horse. I really love to do these things. I don't get to eat the cake at the birthday party, but you know, I, I think they would yeah. be okay. And like yeah. understanding that that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. As yeah. long as they're not using that dollar for the cupcake to go then buy like a candy bar. I think right, they're right. Save up for the video game. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, I had, a, I had somebody I, I met at the global symposium and, Oh, I, I can't remember his name, but it was a young man who spoke he was on the diet for several years when he was younger and now he does some advocacy and with the uh, i think he's um, on the charlie foundation page and anyway and so i had him record i said will you record something for my patient and just tell her you know keep it up good job keep going you know and it was great he recorded uh, let me record him a little encouragement message to send to her because it's hard it's hard for her and yeah Anyway, yeah, it was fun. Cute. I wish I could think of his name right now. I'd give him a shout out. But anyway, it was great. <laughs> that's very cute. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, your book, The Migraine Diet, it strikes me as something that's very practical that people could use and, mm -hmm. and really um, kind of apply in their lives. What what things did you learn about migraine specifically as you were kind of researching that book? Wow. Um, specifically, I mean, it's amazing. And, and most of the research is uh, like the research that that's published is by Dr. DiLorenzo in Italy. And, um, and, and I'm impressed because they came out and this came out since the book came out, um, they came out with a consensus guideline really quickly. Cons I mean, I feel like quickly considering, um, how long they've been researching. And so they already have a consensus guideline out to say, Hey, you know, put that we recommend these diets. We recommend, I think they even recommend length of time 
But what I learned and just from the people, a lot of times I see people with migraine as a secondary condition. I don't have a lot of people that I've seen when they've come in first line. And my, my theory on that is, is because I, I tell people if there's one thing, if I had to say, what was a slam dunk for keto? Like what is the most likely thing to be helped? I would say migraine. And a lot of people, they start keto and sometimes within a week, not everybody, you know, I don't want to oversell, but sometimes within a week, their headaches were gone, you know, or much better, much better. Um, I had one person, it was actually a, a parent of a child I used to see with epilepsy at the hospital. And she started doing keto for migraines and she would always mark down on the calendar uh, when she took, she had injections she took and pills she took all this. And she, you know, tracked on calendar and her husband's like, you know, why aren't you, why aren't you tracking your meds anymore? It's like, I am, I'm just not taking them, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's like, I don't need them. And she was, you know, was doing fabulous um, with it, but it just seems like um, people are helped so quickly. And I've seen people occasionally that have gone on the diet for migraines. And this is just, you know, nice, beneficial, like someone who went on four or five months, hadn't had a migraine almost the whole time. And then some really tough life happened and she just went off keto, you know, fell overboard and she didn't have another migraine for another four or five months. Wow. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. And then fun fact, the reason I'd even ever heard of keto for migraines is um, through the Charlie Foundation, um, Beth Zupakania, she does a lot of planning with some of our global symposiums. And she always makes sure it's a good low carb keto meat food at the symposium. So sometimes people come in there and they're falling out with low blood sugars and stuff if they don't aren't used to eating keto. And one of the nurses um, that I, a nurse that I know I'll just say, uh, she said, yeah, every time I fly, I get a migraine. She flies frequently. She said, every time I fly, I get a migraine. She flies a couple times a month. And, and, and plus has them between times and all that. And she went to our conference up in Banff, Canada. I think, it, I don't know if it was 18 or 16. And she said, yeah, Beth cured my migraines. I'm like what? She said, yeah, I got on the plane to go home. I'd been eating low carb all week and didn't have a migraine on the plane. And it was just amazing to her. And she just thought, what, you know, what's going on? And so she continued eating that way. She was already a very healthy eater, but she wasn't trying to stay in ketosis. And and she said, yeah, I have, I've had one migraine since then. It was about a year later. So I've had one migraine since, and it was when my brother cooked for me and he said it was, you know, low carb. And I think it wasn't as low as we thought. Um, and that's someone who had numerous migraines, you know, several per week, I believe. I know several per month. And anyway, so that's the first I'd ever heard of it. I'm like, wow, good job. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that this worked for migraines. Well, then, then right fast forward. Oh, you give um, epilepsy meds for migraines. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> you know, so when you start connecting all this, which Chris does a fabulous job in brain energy to really explain it all and tie it all together. And I love the pictures and the illustrations he uses with the car and driving. Like, oh my gosh, he puts the cookies right down here where we can all reach them. And, and so, so to speak, yeah, the low carb cookies. Anyway, but yeah, it just, it's just, it just no longer becomes a big deal to apply across these conditions when you mm. realize, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Once you, once you kind of understand that, and then you see all the case studies piling up, it's just mm. unbelievable. I, it, it's, it's so cool to reflect back on the arc of your career and thinking like how you started, how you then transitioned, how, you know, you, you kind of started in the ketogenic world when it was in its like modern infancy, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like there have been studies for a hundred years, but we've kind of lost that and went towards pharma and all this stuff. And now it's at least, you know, more in vogue to talk about it and books coming out and things like that. And, you know, everybody says like, we don't have money. We can't study this yet. We've got amazing philanthropy coming up. We've got amazing foundations. W what has it been like to see this transformation in your career? We're like, we're, we're talking about study. We, we might be able to do studies. We, we can get yeah. consensus you know, agreements out there, like it's kind of changing the, the course of things. It, it really, it's, yeah, it's beyond amazing. I think because I said, I, I literally just fell into it. You know, there was no like, Ooh, I want to do keto. You know, honestly, I said, it fell in, fell into it with a job interview. Um, but to, to go from like, as far as training, um, I told you I had one hour of training and, um, I had Dr. Kossoff's, you know, whatever third edition of the key jank therapies book. And that was it. But I was so busy. I didn't even read the book for a long time. <laughs> you know, so I was on the one hour train. 
and and Beth came in from the Charlie Foundation. She did a training in our center, which she's done 300 of those. And and so so there then I that was maybe a year or two later, you know. So now I have a little bit of training. And then I finally went out to Hopkins, um, spent a day with Dr. Kotsoff. And at that point, and that that just gave me assurance, like, oh, cool. We've really we modeled our program after the consensus guidelines, which is of course what they do because he wrote them. And so um we and I realized at that point I took a deep breath and said, we're fine. You know, once I watched their clinic and saw what they did, and that felt good. And the reason I go into all that is because there was very little training, and now there's fabulous training. So um, of course, Beth has still, you know, through the Charlie Foundation, there's still training. We've expanded that into our keto mastery courses. Um, there's training through some of the different formula companies. They have training and assistance, and their webinars, you know you know, over the, over the top, you know, um, webinars where you can get great training. So that, that now makes it a whole different world to come into keto. Cause, and I love training because when I came in, I was floundering around and desperate and needed help. And there really wasn't a lot. We were all calling Beth. I mean, Beth, Beth's just like, you know, her phone's off the hook because all these dietitians around the country, we have nobody to go to except her. And so she, you know, is kind of like the, the mother, the grandmother here, you know, and continue to train so many people and then, you know, and then web them out and start saying, hey, call Denise, call so-and-so, call, call Lisa. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, and, um, and it just became, you know, where now we have this network of people who've been doing this much longer um, I think of like Heidi Pfeiffer, it, um, she's in, in Boston and, um, Robin Blackford, who's in, um, Chicago at Lurie, and these people who, again, been doing this for, you know, 20 years, 25, Heidi's, I think 25 years. And now you've got, again, now we've got this deep growth. And then when we bring new people in, we have a listserv and we're trying to help, help the newbies out all the time and just, you know, bring them in and make their life, I hope, so much easier and hope their patients' lives so much better because they're able to get, you know, good information right away instead of floundering around. Um, yeah. but I will go and, I, you know, I'm going to self-promote a little bit. So Keto Mastery courses, can I tell about that? Is that okay? Please, oh, please. So, um, yeah, it, it ketomastery.pro, I think, is um, our Keto Mastery training courses. And they're aimed at dietitians, but they're really available to all clinicians. We definitely have physicians and pharmacists and nurses and um, therapists and people that take those as well. And there's a foundational course, which is really, it goes deep down, you know, into the roots as far as, uh, you know, how to implement the diet, how to maintain the diet. Um, it, it also has epilepsy included as a part of that course. And um, there's, I forget if that, I think it's 20 credit hours or 20 CE hours. And then from there you have advanced ketogenic course. So we're kind of assuming, you know, you know, a lot of the foundation, but we go into the different conditions, you know, a psychiatric and um, Alzheimer's and migraines and pregnancy and all these different areas where, you know, we try to kind of highlight in cancer and try to hit all those different areas that you might want to implement the therapy and then lastly, just this fall, we came out with um, a condensed course. So we have some of the foundation in there and then specifically psychiatric conditions because that need is just so great. So we've tried to say, okay, if you are only doing this and you need kind of like speed course, I don't say speed course, but you know, a short course on how to be able to get up and running on keto for that, you know, we can do that. You can take that shorter course and it's on, you know, asynchronous course. And then, but I still really highly recommend the foundational course because, you know, we've taken those things and we've condensed them down where we spend a lot of time on them in the foundation. It's very, you know, not hurry, not rushed. And, and, and just, I don't know, I think, it, I think it's pretty good. And so, but yeah, so that's again, um, a great, um, a great way to get some training. Yeah, very, very under undersold to say, yeah, it's pretty good. It sounds yeah. amazing. It sounds <laughs> incredible, all these different resources. And I, again, I think about the arc of your career and going from working with somebody one on one mm -hmm. in clinic to then training all of these clinicians. What an amazing thing to get to do. Mm -hmm. And you're changing so many yeah. lives that way. You must be yeah. very, very proud. It's so yes, cool. Well, oh, very blessed, very blessed to be a part well, of it. Well, so are we to be able to host you today. This has been a wonderful conversation. Where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? And one more time, where can people go for the Keto Mastery Program? 
So, um, so my website's actually, you, you gave, you gave it a little at the beginning, but it will link to it. But my site is advanced ketogenic therapies.com. And then, and then keto mastery is keto mastery.pro. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. We will link all of that in the show notes. I'll make sure that's correct. <laughs> rather okay, than it's the... all right. I said, it'll get there, but yeah, we, we, we changed our name last year. Awesome. Well, that's okay. great. Well, excellent. Denise yeah. Potter, thank you so very much for taking the time to be on our show today. We know you're very busy changing lots of lives out there, like we said, but so grateful for you. And it's such an honor to host you on our show. So thank you oh. for making the time today. We really appreciate you. Oh gosh. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. And such an honor. Thanks. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.